Great, okay. Um, hi everyone and welcome. Um, my name's uh, Nathan O'Donnell. I'm a writer in residence at Maynooth University. Um, and this is the, the second event in uh, a public program, which I'm, I'm organizing as part of this residency on experimental publishing. Um, I do want to say at the outset to, to just to say thanks to uh, uh, to Maynooth University and to the English department, and particularly Una Frawley, who uh, oversees the residency program, um, and also to Kildare Art Service and to Lucina Russell, um, uh, all, both of whom have been just really um, helpful and supportive in in setting uh, in setting up the residency and helping to to uh, give a framework for this event series. Um, it's been a really great opportunity for me to develop my own work um, as a writer and as a, a, a publisher um, or a micro publisher maybe uh, might be more appropriate to say uh, and also to explore and present some of uh, the, the most interesting research and practice that's going on in the, the wider field of experimental publishing uh, today. Um, before tonight uh, we're going to have we're going to be joined by Nicholas Toburn um, who uh, is a really uh, brilliant um, theorist uh, coming from the field of sociology, but who has done really extraordinary work in this in this uh, this very cross disciplinary field of experimental publishing. Um, and I'll introduce Nicholas shortly. Before doing so, though, I do just want to to maybe outline a little bit about what I mean by experimental publishing, just to give us a, a little bit of context for those who who might be coming at it uh, uh, fresh. Um, it is a wide-ranging term, but but I, I, I think at its simplest, or certainly in the way that I'm, I'm using it, um, I'm referring to the work of practitioners or projects uh, that use publishing as a site of experimentation, you know, at its most basic. That's that's really what I'm what I'm looking at. Um, so talking about work that, that expands our idea of what publishing, as in the act of making public, can be. Um, and this entails, in many cases, a, a critique of the conventions and politics of uh, literary publishing or conventional publishing with the associated ideas of the author, the book as the commodity form, uh, the literary marketplace. And importantly, there's a, a, an embedded critique of copyright here. And so essentially what experimental publishing does uh, is lay out some alternatives. So it's a field that crosses disciplinary boundaries and artistic forms. Um, exploring and, and forging new approaches to the act of making public and it spans things like artist publishing, political and protest publishing, uh, as well as underground publishing um, forms like Samizdat or the zine I would, I would include here. Um, it can be both print and digital and I do think the revived interest in, in experimental publishing in the past decade uh, has to do with uh, questions which uh, th this expansion of post-digital publishing has raised about copyright creativity, piracy, um, etc. So yeah, it's a wide range of, of strategies and processes uh, and it includes practices and projects that embrace collective, collaborative, provisional, political, anonymous or participatory processes. Uh, processes that in different ways disrupt the conceived conventions of the book, um, of publishing, of authorship, uh, so that's my attempt to, to define experimental publishing in sort of two minutes, um, uh, probably a little reductively. Uh, but this is a field, as I say, that tonight's speaker has really looked at in depth, um, particularly for me in, in a hugely, what was a hugely instructive and groundbreaking study um, called Antibook on the Art and Politics of Radical Publishing. And this was a book published in 2016. It's a book I have found hugely illuminating. Um, full of really thoughtful and, and useful theoretical propositions. So I, I mean, I would really highly recommend um, the highly recommend reading this to, to anybody who's interested in this area. Uh, Nick is, is reader in sociology at the University of Manchester. Um, he's the author of Antibook, as I've just mentioned, um, and also Deleuze, Mark and Marx and Politics uh, from 2003. Um, and he tells me he's working on a, a, a new book on uh, Robin Hood Gardens, which um, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to in, in, in due course. Um, he's published on political theory, experimental publishing, social movements and architecture, and is a member of the editorial board of the Culture and Politics Journal, New Formations. So I'm going to hand over to Nick now. We'll keep questions to the end. Um, you can log questions as we go along using the chat function and we'll hold them till, the, till afterwards, obviously. Um, 
yeah uh so at this point i guess yeah I'll, I'll hand over nick thanks so much for joining us i'll drop out now and then i'll rejoin at the end for uh to chair for questions thanks very much you're on mute you're on mute there nick start as i mean to go on <laughs> uh, many thanks nathan uh, for that introduction and for my university for uh, this invitation I thought I could contribute to the series with a talk about experimental political publishing, uh, or more specifically, I want to consider how anti-black violence and, and uprising against that violence can reverberate through and transform the material forms of a book. I'll be focusing on an anonymously published book of tweets from the 2015 Baltimore uprising, a book that I want to present as an anti-book of riots or a riot book. And I focus in on this book in order to open out to a set of themes, problems and methods by which experimental publishing might respond to our wrenching present of the movement for black lives. Now, approaching racial terror and uprising through the lens of experimental publishing may look like a depoliticizing distraction. It's certainly true that the structural and physical violence of racialization is immediately pressing in ways that issues in publishing will rarely, if ever, be. And yet, publishing has played a significant role in shaping the conditions, forms and experiences of racism and struggles against white supremacy. Take the uh, terrifying example of lynching photographs circulated in the US well into the early 20th century as printed postcard souvenirs for white filial bonding. Or take the southern states laws against teaching black people to read and write, passed into new statute up until the 1840s. Or switching the perspective to resistance, which is my concern here, we can think of the significant role of abolitionist tracts, the publishing genre of slave narratives, or anti-colonial books like Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth in galvanizing struggles against racial violence. So publishing then is at once a significant terrain of black resistance to racial violence and a terrain that is fraught and ill-fitting. Hence Cornel West uh, writes this and I'll, I'll share my screen. So this is Cornel West. The er text of black culture is neither a word nor a book, not an architectural monument or a legal brief. Instead, it is a guttural cry and a wrenching moan. If we can understand this guttural cry as operative within publishing, then it is also shaped by publishing, by publishing's material forms, processes and relations. The examples I've just given illustrate that point, where the art articulation of racialization and publishing is not the mediation of pre-given racial forms, but is partially generative of them. And it's on this fraught terrain of racialization and publishing that I want to approach this book. The 2015 Baltimore Uprising, a teen epistolary. It's an experimental book whose qualities I'll turn to shortly, but I first want to say a little bit about how I understand experimental publishing more widely um, through the concept of the anti-book. Uh, as Nathan uh, mentioned a moment ago, it's a concept that I develop in my book of that title through a range of communist and emancipatory publishing projects as they experiment with a set of publishing forms, forms which you can see uh, from the table of contents here, starting at the top, uh, the manifesto, the pamphlet, book, author, magazine, and myth. So let me sketch out a definition of this concept of the anti-book. An anti-book is a work of publishing that critically interrogates and experiments with its publishing materiality. This materiality is a mesh of forms, processes, and relations, including writing, editing, design, media objects and platforms, distribution and readership, all of which bear the capitalist economies of production and consumption that govern the field of publishing. 
And I see the anti-book as a communist uh, concept, a communist theory of publishing. Uh, that is to say, it pertains to publishing projects that are wrought from a social terrain coursing with hostile relations of class, gender and racialization, relations that they seek not to accommodate with, uh, but to abolish. And last, in foregrounding the formal and sensory qualities of textual media, the anti-book is also an art of political publishing, one that occasionally takes leave of the textual aspects of publishing altogether. Now, my aim with this concept is not to delimit a distinct group of anti-books, but rather to focus attention on concrete experiments in political publishing, in all their rich materiality, and indeed with all the concepts that they or their readers generate for reflecting on their particular forms. And it's one such experiment and concept that I turn to now and for the rest of this talk. Anonymously published, this is a book comprised entirely of screen grabbed tweets, some 650 of them. The tweets were posted by young black inhabitants of Baltimore in the midst of the two weeks of riots that ensued on the police killing of 25 year old Freddie Gray. Using a police technique for inflicting violence without legal culpability, Freddie Gray's neck was broken during a so-called rough ride, cuffed alone in the back of a police van, deliberately careening through the streets of Baltimore. I want to understand this book as a riot book. It's a concept or a problem space that can be initially set out with the help of the literary critic Maurice Blanchot from his response to the flurry of books published in the wake of another uprising, that of the French May 68. These books about 68, Blanchot contends, whether as epitaph, analysis, celebration or condemnation, all contributed to the same end, the summation and the closure of the uprising. And this for Blanchot was an effect consequent on the book's totalizing form, where the riotous events were corralled by established explanatory frameworks, claimed by authorized writers, and fashioned into standardized formats, narrative structures, and marketable book commodities. Here the book in Blanchot's uh, memorable phrase is a refined form of oppression. Everything, and here he's talking about the 68 uprising, everything that disturbs, calls, threatens, and finally questions without expecting an answer, without resting in certainty, never will we enclose it in a book, which even when open tends toward closure, a refined form of oppression. No more books, never again a book, so long as we maintain our relation with the upheaval of the rupture. Well, this is an attack on books, but not on publishing. Blanchot's text celebrates the tracts, posters, bulletins, murals produced and circulated amidst the uprising, whose adequacy to the uprising resides above all in their fragmentary, fleeting and incomplete form, in their ruination of totalizing enclosure, their ruination, in other words, of the book. As he writes, uh, tracks, posters, bulletins, words of the street, infinite words, they do not say everything, on the contrary, they ruin everything. And crucially, he says all this in a publishing outlet that was itself fragmentary and experimental, an anonymously authored, collective, communist magazine called Comité, the organ of the Student Workers' Action Committee of, of May 68, of which Blanchot was a founder. Like the post hoc books about 68, Comité came after the uprising, but contrary to those books, it's a publication that seeks in Blanchot's words to prolong the rupture into and through publishing form. Now I want to suggest that it's precisely this prolonging of the uprising into publishing form that characterizes the Baltimore uh, book of tweets. What makes it a riot book? But let me stress that its experimental form doesn't bear uprising in general, 
but uprising against the specific racialized conditions of Baltimore 2015, the conditions of our present moment of the Black Lives Matter movement. And this in the specific medial conditions of today's post-digital publishing environment, where print and digital technologies interlace and collide. This book of tweets is a wrecked book where racial terror and rupture wreak, wreak havoc on the book form. But the point is not that this occurs, but how it does so. Um, so what aspects of racialization and publishing it interrogates with regard to what specific political and aesthetic problems and what are the riotous forms of publishing that emerge? Now, in an article I've written about this book of tweets, I pick out seven of these problems and forms of which I'll talk through four or so here, some rather briefly. And my first point, the first form, uh, concerns what is missing from this book. The uprising has knocked away all the means by which books typically establish their po political credentials. It lacks a preface, afterward, promotional blurb, or identification of its editor or even its publisher. Neither does it contain chapters, page numbers, place and date of publication, or an ISBN. Really, except for the title on the front cover, it contains nothing but the 650 screen grabbed tweets. I'll return to these absences with regard to different features of the book's form, but my first point is that the absence of editorial text wards off the textual means by which the book in Blanchot's terms would be the uprising summation and closure, and instead draws readers into the uprising's own communicative scene. On turning the cover, one immediately tips into the flow of tweets without a colophon of a pause, much less any introductory fashioning of the content. And the effect is both intimate and disorienting. The first tweet we encounter is this brutally frank statement in text and image of the facts of Freddie Gray's death. Then the sequential flow commences the day he died the tweets covering the two week period of the main swell of the uprising set out as they are in chronological order. Now I couldn't here convey the complexity of the content, but it includes uh, fury at the police, images of trashed police vehicles, euphoria at collective looting, tactical guidance, conflicts with parents, concerns about canceled high school proms, uh, critique of social media appropriation, appraisal of the effects and consequences of the riots, anxieties about friends, and so on. It is, of course, also a field of playful social media and black vernaculars, including, I gather, phrases particular to Baltimore. And this communicative scene is also affective, as racial terror and vertiginous uprising cleave through the words, emojis, and images, conveying the tremor of lived experience that is typically filtered out of, a, of political publishing and theoretical systematization. I don't mean to suggest that the absence of editorial text, sorry, I don't mean to suggest that in the absence of editorial text, the book refuses analysis. Rather, it insists that analysis should come from engaging in part with the communicative content of the uprising content produced by black Baltimore youth who are structurally excluded from the public discourse about their lives. And it's notable in this regard that in making the book during the course of the uprising, uh, the publishers proceeded in their Twitter search by excluding trending hashtags and instead homing in on local landmarks, store names and idiosyncrasies of the, of the uprising. As one of the publishers explained to me by email, they found that trending hashtags such as hashtag Baltimore uprising and the like operated at a scale removed from the riots communicative scene, uh, a meta scale that served the uprisings packaging according to established news agendas and received interpretive frames. Now, if something of the internal discourse and affect of the uprising is conveyed through the book's tweets, so is the uprising's temporality. 
And this is my second uh, feature of the book's riotous form. The fragmentary and incomplete nature of each tweet and of readers' movement through the tweets bears the rupture in continuous time that is an intrinsic quality of being caught up in a riot. The book's tweets occasionally follow short conversational streams and carry recurring motifs, but these appear in disjointed series, imperfectly indexed to specific features of the unfolding, lurching events, events for, for which readers are unprepared, lacking the imposed order and pacing of narrative, chapters, or even page numbers. As a review in Baltimore's City Paper put it, the book's tweets send us back to those days when we didn't know what was happening or what was going to happen next. Turning to the book's um, third formal feature, unlike the uh, consumer goods encountered in the pages of this book, um, this book is not consumed as a looted commodity. But it is nonetheless a significant interruption in the commodity form of books. As Adorno puts it in his late essay, Bibliographical Musings, the booker's commodity sidles up to the reader. Through marketing mechanisms and exaggerated formats, commodity books come to exist not for themselves in their expressive uniqueness, but for something other in their generality. They are units of exchange, always, as he puts it, ready to serve the customer. Now Adorno's comments here recall Marx's swipe uh, at the debasement of material culture that is attendant on the commodity form. Marx writes, um, private property, as it abstracts from the qualities of objects to turn them into carriers of exchangeable value, alienates the individuality not only of people, but also of things. Things get alienated in capitalism. By contrast, this Twitter book severs the means to universal exchangeability, allowing its particular material qualities to come forward unconstrained by the demands and circuits of marketing. The absence of an ISBN cuts it from the global logistical mechanism of commodity books and the absence of publisher details and editor name further limits its market uh, visibility and its orientation toward exchange. This anonymity also blocks a key means by which books turn language into property and profit for it refuses the author function where the polymorphous flow of discourse uh, is captured and rendered into the marketable value of an individual author and a publisher. And this book also steps outside legitimate economic models of production and distribution, for it's produced without payment using a print shop copy scam and is distributed for free or as a gift to friends and acquaintances uh, or sold at book fairs for a pay what you choose price. Turning now from its anti-commodity form to its fourth ruptural feature, there's clearly some political uh, subjectivity uh, evident in the tweets, the kind of thing that we would expect from book, political books with the word uprising uh, in their title. But this subjectivity is far from uh, straightforward without an apparent passage to redress. Readers can't fail to notice that Almost all the faces in the book have their eyes redacted. This was a provision on the part of the publishers to preserve anonymity, given the number of tweets that feature law-breaking activity. And such techniques are common to the visual culture of radical political media today. But the sheer accumulation here of redacted eyes on black faces makes for deeply unsettling viewing. For vision is a highly racialized capacity. Blocking black capacity to return the look of the slave master, to return the look of the police, is a constitutive feature of anti-black racism. Indeed, it was precisely for returning the look of a police officer that Freddie Gray was arrested, the first step on the path to his murder. You might well ask then, in redacting these eyes, doesn't this book repeat the violent prohibition of black capacity to look? It's certainly a different aesthetic procedure 
to that of a more prominent image associated with the Black Lives Matter movement, where on the Millions March in New York City in December 2014, the eyes of Eric Garner, who was choked to death by police, were instead accentuated. The point I want to make, though, is that facial redaction foregrounds the structural bar to black subjectivity that inheres in the monotonous persistence of racial violence, from slavery through the Jim Crow segregation laws to today's racializing regime of prison and police murder with impunity. Against the consoling, self-bolstering stories that civil society tells itself about racial progress and redress, this book impresses upon readers the structural bar to black subjectivity in order to insist on the ruptural root and branch transformation that will be necessary for its abolition. If progressive subjectivity is barred in this book, in this aspect of the book's visual design, it's also barred in the young people's Twitter content. The protagonists of this book have few illusions about democratic representation, legal process or economic uplift. One tweet uh, tells, one tweet says, they tell us when we vote, we're being heard. Know this, the uprising is an example of us young people being heard. Another, downtown business revenue don't help our communities or our schools. I say, fuck me, burn everything. And here, the fact of charging the police with Freddie Gray's killing doesn't at all mean that they'll be uh, convicted as was proven to be correct the following summer, uh, when all the officers had all the officers were acquitted or had their charges dropped. The book then ends with a monotonous nine pages of tweets that register without closure the death of Freddie Gray. A comment stream prompted by a tweet of his portrait and a coffin which requests don't scroll down without typing RIP. There's no uptick in mood here, no happy ending, and this itself is a significant break with the book form. As the Afro-pessimist writer Frank B. Wilderson argues, even the most relentlessly critical books find themselves compelled by the values and institutions of culture and publishing to provide an uplifting ending. Their writers, in his words, consciously or unconsciously peel away from the strength and the terror of their evidence in order to propose some kind of coherent, hopeful solution to things. In this way, Wilderson contends, the book form serves to integrate vertiginous critique back into the world as it is, bolstering civil society's self-consolidating parameters of legible, coherent and reasonable action. I'll comment now upon uh, a last riotous feature of this book, um, which concerns its visual design. One design approach would have been to lift uh, the text of the Baltimore tweets and typeset them to the high-end typographic standards of commercial publishing, uh, with book aesthetics thus dominating the medial encounter. as is common to the proto-genre of Twitter books. But Baltimore Uprising takes a different path, where the original visual form is screen grabbed from Twitter, then pasted, laser printed, and photocopied into a codex book. The visual scene of Twitter is thus maintained and dominant, but in the manner of a degraded copy. It's what the artist Hito Steyl calls a poor image. Perfect images, Steyl writes, are the high-end visual products of commercial media, bearing infrastructures and evaluative paradigms that produce, broker, and protect them as image and commodity. Poor images, in contrast, are substandard copies of substandard copies, the massive superfluity of low resolution digital files that flood through global media channels. They are distributed for free, squeezed through the slow digital connections 
compressed, reproduced, ripped, remixed, uh, copied and pasted into other channels of distribution. There is a politics for Steyl here. Uh, for poor images, in their violation of perfect aesthetic values, in their superfluity, and in their impersonal collective production and sharing might give a new political aura to the image. More so, she associates this degraded superficiality, sorry, superfluity uh, of the image with class and racialization. Poor images, as she writes, as she alludes to Fanon's figure of anti-colonial uprising, are the contemporary wretched of the screen, the lumpen proletarian in the class appearance, in the class society of appearances. Well, I think this is what transpires in the visual aesthetic of Baltimore uprising. The tweets are wrenched from Twitter's clean, unifying and innocuous interface. That visual scene epitomized by the infantilizing baby blue dove that is Twitter's corporate logo. They are wrenched too from the platform affirming discourse of the Twitter revolutions as the uprisings of the so-called Arab Spring were sometimes erroneously represented. And they are wrenched from the spectacularization of poor images by which black Americans have been rendered visible in the present moment. Those body cams and cell phone videos of police murder that so easily serve, as Wilderson has argued, as the modern lynching photograph, a visual tool for white filial bonding. At the same time, as the Baltimore book renders Twitter to the poor image, it does the same for the Codex book, pulling away from the high-end visual design of commercial publishing. With its textless tape-covered stapled spine, its flimsy paper covers and its degraded visual quality. It is a poor image book quality uh, made strikingly apparent when the book is compared to its commercial reprint by the established radical publisher AK Press with its full colour card covers and the white ISBN box of the commodity form stamped across the image of Black Uprising. Compared to this, the original looks like a pirate copy. And it affirms this pirate quality uh, in that the experimental, no press, Xeroxed and anti-commodity edition is clearly the most urgent and desirable of the two. And on that point, I'll end. Thanks very much. That was great. Thanks, Nick. That was really fascinating um uh and expansive and um yeah uh, i think you know you opened with a kind of question about how speaking about publishing of this kind can 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 can, can match the, the the urgency of what's you know the, the the reality of police brutality and so on but i think that that um yeah i think you you've 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 really highlighted or identified a a a, a, a real urgency um, and uh, uh, a, a kind of um, yeah, there's there's a, I guess you're articulating something about the urgency of political publishing as uh, as a, a sort of um, intervention in and a prolonging of uh, particular riotous energies, um, uh, necessary riotous energies. Uh, I yeah, I found there's lots of things that I've kind of I've taken notes here and that. Um, we could start having a bit of a conversation about. Um, I do want to, you know, if, if people have questions from the audience as well, I know um, I know this will be uh, resonant for, for many of the people who are um, attending. So please, please do feel free to, to add questions to the comment thread. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I was really struck in listening to, to uh, what you're speaking about there about this this idea that, that uh, we might, uh, that that the that Baltimore up, that Baltimore uprising might represent uh, a kind of an exemplification of a riotous form of publishing, um, and I'm I I would love to uh, yeah to that that feels like a very suggestive proposition to me that perhaps there needs to be a 
a, 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 an attempt to evaluate what a riotous form might look like in a post-digital era. Mm. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you spoke about Blanchot's uh, description of those riotous, ephemeral um, paraphernalia, the kind of protest paraphernalia surrounding 68. And there's, you know, we can look at a whole tradition of, of protest publishing um, that maybe corresponds with this, this, this idea of the anti-book. Um, but yeah, I, the particular conditions of the present moment um, and the particular implications of, uh, uh, of publishing and in relation to race um, and racialized violence uh yeah perhaps they they uh present a moment for us to to redefine what what a riotous form of publishing might be what what publishing uh that corresponds to the the riot or the protest looks like so yeah i mean i wonder if 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 you in a way that I mean that's what you've just been talking about so it's uh <laughs> but I, I i'm i'm curious whether you see this in a context within the framework of of um of other public publications or other forms of publishing that are happening currently in relation to um to the protests in the us and and elsewhere um yeah do you see this as part of a bigger um trajectory yeah, I, th th thanks, Nathan. I think, I, yeah, I'd like to make a couple of points. One about Blanchot here, and then, and then your your second point. I haven't seen starting with the second point. I haven't seen anything um, from the later, the current, last summer's wave of uprisings in the states uh, in terms of publishing as such. The, it struck me that the the DIY film group called um, Unicorn Publishing. Oh, so Unicorn, mm, I can't quite remember the title now, um, who were doing fantastic uh, film work during the uprising, interviewing people on the streets and relaying it live via their website and Twitter feed and so on. Um, that struck me as a very uh, vital, inventive, media reflexive kind of way of engaging with those rights. Um, so that that's the only, that's the only media form I've seen. Um, well, there's also the destruction of the statues and the graffitiing of the statues and so on, which is also very interesting in terms of kind of remediating and, and uh, textually complexifying, if I can say that, you yeah. know, these kinds of entities. But I haven't seen it in publishing. I'd love to, but, I, you know, I mm. haven't done. Um, I think the the risk in what I was doing, you know, I'm saying this is an anti book, and yet the risk is I'm focusing on a book, <laughs> that you know, so it's it's the book that is being that's being wrecked through the process. So I think it's important for Blanchot and for what I'm hoping to draw from it, a sense that this is in no way a culmination of the riot. It's just one of the many fragments um, that can extend them in productive political emotional ways. Um, and so in a way that the the book should also push people back into the tweets, you know, mm. or, and all the other media forms and, and expressions that the riots are producing. Um, but insofar as we still have books, then books should have something like this done to them, if you see what I mean. You know, and it's it just struck me so as so powerful the way Blanchot comes in at the end of 68 and says, I hate all these books written about our revolution. You know, that all of them just closed it down. And I think everybody reading those lines knows exactly what he's saying. Um, uh, so how do we respond in writing in ways that don't close it down? Mm. The, 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 just to say one brief thing, the, um, I think what's important too, is that in Blanchot, he gets, that the media forms should be ruptured by the rupture and he makes some interesting interventions there certainly in terms of anonymity and in terms of um the importance of a kind of fragmentary publishing he doesn't say much more than that whereas this book i think is a huge leap actually because it it operates in so many different aspects of publishing form you know i looked at four of them i think there were sort of seven or eight or perhaps more which is a great leap on from on show um, and also it's a leap that's that's really inserted in our time which is a very different time to 68 you know a time of you know the, uh, the kind of this uh, the murderous um, global capitalism you know a, a time of black lives matter 
you know, all of these different problems of our time, which were not the problems of 68. Um, they're much more intensified now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I, I mean, I wonder, just one follow on question. There's, there's a couple of questions coming in on the, the thread, but um, in terms of the, the, the publishers of the of Baltimore Uprising, um, I, I'm curious to what extent the, the uh, are they thinking in these terms in in relation to this book, or because uh, I know you prefer to having conversations with the publishers. Um, uh, I wonder what mm. are these kind of material considerations um, happening organically, or are they are they are there decisions being made about this uh, at, at, uh, in relation to publishing? I mean, do they do they think of this in relation to a, a broader field of publishing, or is there? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, uh, no, it's, I think it's, it's, it's you're right to be curious. I think it's uh, it's it's difficult to talk about the publishers because. Well, it's not it's not actually difficult but in talking about the publishers it's important to uh res i think to respect the book mm -hmm. and them as the publishers as as an organization that wanted to always reflect away from them you, okay. you yeah. know back into the the conditions of racialization and police murder and so on um hence the anonymity you know says don't look at us mm -hmm. <laughs> you know look at the book look at look at the riots um, but of course that in itself is an interesting thing to say mm -hmm. about publishing um, and there's no reason why we can't then talk about it as an interesting thing uh, to say about publishing so i had a, a small amount of email exchange with them not not a great deal um but one time when i first gave my first impression to this book in a talk somebody um got their phone out midway through and just googled the title and of course because we live in digital age found the name of the publisher you know so this is this post-digital moment that it's anonymous on the book but of course it's not anonymous in the world because google search finds it immediately um and they're a group called research and destroy new york city uh that publish you know these sort of small press very small or neat one might say no press uh works that are almost all appropriations it's really interesting um uh, there's a great pamphlet they do on on um strikes uh, that, that illustrates how trade unions so often function to destroy strikes um, uh, simply by including all the lists of regulations that trade unions put together to distribute to the picket lines um, for example um, so they publish by appropriation you know um, there's another pamphlet they do called cats hate cops and it's something like 100 years or more of newspaper articles where cats have attacked the police <laughs> Um, quite literally god knows how you go about researching that simply just just sort of um photocopying the newspaper articles um so they're clearly very very reflexive about publishing clearly uh, uh and they they're also it's also very clear that that they are making a serious intervention in the way the left if we call it that tends to appropriate riotous events or, or political events for their own narratives you know, so it's not just that books, it's not just that commercial publishers might appropriate the riots for their own ends, but actually, you know, writers, theorists, you know, so we will be told that this was the riot of the multitude or um, the or whatever it might be, you know, the new working class or something. And I think they're saying, let's just hold off those mm -hmm. mechanisms of over-interpretation and let the riots speak as much as they can in this way, seriously. Yeah. Know. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting to hear and to to get a sense of that. Um, yeah, this publishing by appropriation as as uh, as a way of maybe yeah, in some respects refusing the, the we were talking about authorship but refusing the editorship or mm. or somehow resisting. I mean, I think that's a very interesting proposition. Yeah. Um, Okay, I, I'm I'm seeing a, a couple of questions in the, the chat, which I I, I think we, we could relay. Um, Alison is is here first. Say, um, Alison, I I really enjoyed your talk, Nicholas. Thanks so much. Can you talk a bit about any copyright issues that the publishers might have had? I know you talked about the reduction of facial features. Is that the only obstacle the publishers faced? Yeah, it's a thorny question, isn't it? Um, so I I positioned the book as a kind of anti-commodity book insofar as it you know refuses many of the mechanisms of 
the commodity form. Um, uh, clearly, it has no copyright itself, you know, obviously. Um, the, the question you're asking is about how, what's its copyright relationship to the, to the tweets themselves um, and perhaps to Twitter, you know, as a platform. Um, so they pulled these tweets during the riots that, you know, and of course the tweets were public, but there it's, you know, there's this, this complicated sense, I think, in which, you know, how are, to, to what extent are tweets public or not? Um, I mean, formally they are, uh, insofar as anyone can find them. Um, and I think they, I think that question is left open and it's an awkward question. You know, the, 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 presumably the, uh, the people who posted the tweets weren't, weren't asked if their tweets can go uh, into the book. Um, I gather that some of them, some of the tweeters, some of the, the young people that sent the tweets found out about the book and, you know, were kind of moderately excited by the prospect and then moved on with their lives, you know. Um, uh, but that's all I know about their relationship to it. The, the face, the eyes are redacted. Um, and key identifying um, aspects of the Twitter accounts are, are redacted um, for, you know, for the same kinds of reasons. Um, but, you know, you see the name. I think it's difficult. I think it's important that you see the names of the tweeters uh, to, to get that sense of not just uh, not just a I was going to say an anonymous flow. Um, let's say not just a, a flow without specificity, if you see what I mean. It's a flow of words, but also of names and conversations. And, and that's a, I think that's a really vital quality that, that, that one can get from reading the book in the way that one would never, in the past, we could never have had that. We would have only ever read leaflets from riots or perhaps some graffiti, but that would be about it. You know, or maybe, a t well, I mean, a telegram isn't sort of direct from a right. During the 70s in Italy, people were telephoning to pirate radio shows during riots to broadcast um, the, the riots live. So we have had this kind of imminent relationship to riots before in the media forms. But I think it's important that we see that, you know, in this, however awkward it is, you know, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. Yeah. And it throws up, I mean, questions again about, about private and public that, I feel are acknowledged maybe in the title, you know, the absurd title uh, is an epistolary, a teen epistolary, and the epistolary form, of course, is, is some is a space where private and public um, are, uh, are complicated or tra have traditionally been kind of complicated. So, mm. yeah, I think, anyway, there's there's lots, yeah, lots to think about there. Um, uh, Tom, Tom comes in and, uh, after that and, and asks, uh, I was struck by the final comment about the anti-aesthetic of the original version potentially becoming a desirable aesthetic object um, com uh, compared to the reprint. How can the book resist getting stuck in this loop? I wonder what... Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm glad you asked that. I, I don't think I was clear enough at the end there. Um, for me, becoming a desirable object is good. <laughs> um, if, and just to sort of take you back just a little bit with that amazing quotation from Marx, where he says that capitalism doesn't just alienate people, it alienates things. Um, and I, I, in my book on this, I develop a concept called the communist object to try and think about how we can have intense, affective, sensory relations with objects. And that that has a, and that that in itself is a kind of communist mode of being. Um, because in, in Marxism and left culture, we too often think that material culture is sort of bad, you know, that subjectivity good, objects bad. And I, 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 don't, think, I don't think that's what, I think Marx gets at the idea that, that communism would be the liberation of objects as much as it will, well, as well as being the liberation of people. So I like that it's desirable, um, but of course that then does, and this goes to your question, Tom, that then does raise the prospect that it then becomes valuable, you know, economically valuable. Um, uh, and so I think, and of course it will, it, 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 if a book like this ever became kind of, I don't know, very well known, then it would become, you know, almost without, without fail become valuable to some extent. But I, what, what I think is interesting is the publishers still try and cut away at even that prospect um, by, for example, insisting that there's no addition to the book. 
uh, and on their website, they have this really sort of intriguing line underneath their, the name of the publisher. It says, no edition, but the open edition. Um, and so these books might be produced indefinitely, uh, you know, at any moment when they get access to a copier or when they have the time or when they feel like it's still worth, if they feel like it's still worth printing and so on. So that in a way reduces the rarity function, at least in, in at least kind of conceptually, of course, practically, there aren't that many copies of them because they have to make them all themselves. Um, but so maybe my other point is if it's desirable, then the question is it's almost desirable insofar as it, you enjoy it aesthetically, you know, and as an object and as something to carry and hold, but also in a way that pushes you back to this more radical mode of publishing. You know, you could imagine, you could imagine if you were this way inclined, a book like this might encourage you to do other kinds of experimental publishing yourself, um, rather than to encourage you to buy more books um, from Amazon, if you see what I mean. Um, so that it, it being desirable pushes you back into the realm of publishing, potentially, or back into the realm of DIY publishing or communist publishing. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's another question there that I think connects to what we're, we're talking about in terms of the, the object and, and this question about value and, and scarcity. Um, so Amy asks, uh, she says, it's super interesting to, to recognize the multiple strata that hydro publishing works within, mm -hmm. all the differing, le differing levels of energy consumption involved in their production. I'm very interested in your response to resisting the fetishization of this book uh, and how you're talking about it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really nicely framed question. Um, yeah, so the way I talked about it, the, uh, the sort of the field of publishing has all of these elements, you know, writing, design, media objects, distribution and stuff. But you're right, it also, each one of those is also multiply stratified uh, depending on context and user and so on. And one person's uh, desirable material form is someone else's hard labour you know, in the production of the staples in a factory or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. So you're right, none of these, these, these levels are never kind of, um, they're never innocent or they're never freed from, from relations of domination or capital and so on. Um, so I think that's very true. And I think it's important. Uh, so in, in my book, I insist that one of the first things that experimental publishing must do is recognize that it is always part of capital. And so, you know, the anti-book is, is anti books as capitalist commodities. But the mistake would be to think as perhaps you, you know, as perhaps you could think having heard me talk today is that some objects finally do escape from capitalist relations. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm saying this book is only ever interrogating, pushing, trying to overcome, but it's not itself, you know, a free object or a you know, something that's liberated. Um, so you're right, you would, one would need to attend to all those different relations. Um, in its circulation and in its production. Um, in terms of fetishization, I see, I quite like the, the notion that one might have a communist fetishism, you know, that, that we go, we move fetishism into a category, if almost a positive category, to be taken by objects and material culture in a way that undoes us. And so Marx says, the object should strike the sensorium. It's not that we should use it and control it. The object should sort of unnerve and unsettle us. And that that's a kind of feature of communist kind of um, objects. Whereas fetishism as we normally use it, or at least Marx normally uses it, is, is, um, is really a fixation on value, you know, on commodities as value rather than on commodities as, as objects. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, 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 I and I, I just keep coming back to this this idea that 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 a riotous form might 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 be the the again as you say I mean and and I think that's a really useful and instructive thing to to mention particularly I mean some of the people in the audience are uh, are, uh, are students at the moment who are looking at ex experimental publishing um, and this question of a kind of anti-capitalist publishing with uh, as I think anybody who works in this field you are you yeah you are coming up with, you come up constantly against the limits of what of what an anti-capitalist form of publishing can be. You can't escape capital. You can gesture toward it or you can, um, yeah. And you can, you can sort of practically be moving against it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's not just, it's not just kind of symbolic, 
-hmm. it's practical uh, but it's not it never nothing ever escapes sort of in any kind of permanent sense i guess mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I, there's a couple more questions here, which I think we've got a we've got a few more minutes. We're just coming up to six, but um, uh, I think we probably can fit these two in. Um, so, so Luke writes, uh, I find the resistance to conventional means of producing, distributing, regulating, um, and thus its representation very interesting. The original book feels much closer to the riots than the reprint. Do you think, generally speaking, that publishers and designers uh, are at risk of whitewashing in the interest of creating commercially viable um algorithm safe material mm. yes i think um because that because we're always drawn into you know our, our way our, our, almost our kind of the social structures of design writing publishing and so on are, are so uh a coursing with capitalist you know relations and so every time we we write or make a book or what have you always drawn into those patterns because they're the they're the, the bedrock if you like of publishing um and so i think there is always that risk it's the, the effort is pulling away from it but of course in, in the pulling away that's when it becomes interesting you know i mean the, uh, and so i think when you get that second edition you know this one um which of course is the kind of the glossy one and, and maybe superficially looks the most appealing. Of course, I can't imagine that there are many people that would spend more than five minutes with those two editions who would prefer that one, if you see what I mean. And because it's a sense in which, and having been made glossy and made more marketable, it really has lost something. You wouldn't know that if you didn't see the first edition, of course. You know, that, that's, I, I find this interesting that the, the two are very usefully experienced together critiquing each other it, one of them accentuates the qualities of the other the other critiques the other um and of course some people you know if people have said well look this the second edition will reach more people yeah i mean that's true um but of course neither of them are going to change the world <laughs> you know so to, to evaluate it solely on the basis of it having a wider distribution seems to miss the point um and so i think publishers are always at risk of those kinds of problems yeah yeah i mean i think um uh, that uh, in fact that was the, the, the last question so um but I do yeah one thing that's occurring to I mean I know we're talking about this within the kind of communist brain um but I'm being there, there's uh there's a, a a quote by an anarchist theorist Colin Ward he talks a lot about um uh about the kinds of um activity the, the horizontality that happens at moments of protest um and moments of riot and moments of revolt and he he, he formulates this this theory of spontaneous order um, the argument being that, that you know when when order breaks down when sort of hierarchies break down and a kind of spontaneous order happens amongst participants in, in at moments like these and yeah for for me I'm, I, I, I guess it's you know he talks I, I, I mean I've used that or thought about that in relation to education and the kind of um, alternative education structures that, that happen at those moments of protest. Um, where you have, you know, you think about things like the teaching um, uh, and, yeah, and other kinds of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, protest curricula and so on. Mm. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I, I'm, it's, this is, this is a bit, uh, not very clearly formulated, but I, I mean, I guess what, what we might be looking at here is a, a form of publishing that corresponds to that. To yeah. that in this order um, yeah and it's attentive to those dynamics within i mean these tw this book these are not the tweets these are the screen grab copies of the tweets in a book but they mm. give you some inkling i think of some of those patterns of association that were going on um mm. they give you more of it than the research that only looked at the big hashtags you know which is the nice yeah. point the publishers make um but if we were to analyze or to engage with what was happening on the ground you're right we would then have to do a different kind of research i suppose to understand who was what what networks of people were circulating yeah. what and so on so one of the tweets is calls for the um the trashing of the mondormin mondormin uh, shopping mall which was the start of the event and so you sort of see um a tactical moment you know in the book and one then would understand that that had spread and had had certain effects and so on mm. um, yeah i think i mean yeah I, 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 uh, 
I, I, I suppose I'm, maybe it's something about the decentralized um, um, authorship of this particular book is, is prompting me to think about it in relation to, to a kind of anarchist formulation, perhaps. Mm. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't draw a hard boundary between communists and anarchists no, in yeah. that <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, certainly around questions of you know organisation. Mm. and uh, you know the levels of hierarchies of organization and spontaneity and things mm. i think it's often anarchist thinkers who have done a lot of the really good work there mm. yeah oh well, and that was just i, I it, it occurred to me so i thought I'd, I'd throw it into the mix mm. um i mean i guess we, we've 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 come to the the end of the hour and i think um i mean there's so much more we could we could discuss here but I, this has really been brilliant um i i i i, I so enjoyed the talk the discussion and I'm sure everybody um, who is listening in has also uh, uh, taken a lot from this. Well, thank um, you. So yeah, I mean, I guess it just remains to, to say thanks, Nick, for for joining um, and for giving so generously with the the from your research. Um, yeah, and yeah, I mean, I guess thanks everybody for listening in. Uh, yeah. Thanks again to the thanks for the questions as well. They really you know, for, yes, absolutely. yeah. Thanks for yeah. Thanks to everybody for the really wonderful. Um, and thoughtful questions and response. Um, yeah, I, I guess we'll leave it there. I mean, the, 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 this is, as I said, part of a, an ongoing program. So um, the next uh, the next event is going to take place uh, same time on the 25th of March. Um, Janneke Ajema is going to speak about uh, post-publishing in pandemic times. So um, I'll be looking forward to that. But yes, thanks again, Nick, for everything. Uh, Thank you. And thanks, Nathan. Thanks very much. We'll leave it there. Okay.